I think having a seminary on a college campus is both unusual and yet a great advantage to both university and seminary. So let's make this uh, a real opportunity for us as a seminary community. Watching ourselves, practicing the three W's, doing all the things that we need to do, and encouraging by our good example the undergrads to do the same. It's a little more difficult for them, a little bit younger, they are a little bit, they feel like a little bit more invincible. Um, so we can be a good influence. So I invite our seminary community to be that beacon of light and that great influence, all right? So know that the undergrads do look up to the seminary. And they see, they see you doing the things that are necessary. It'll encourage them to do the same. Okay. Now, the presentation, my presentation this morning has always been on the topic of discernment. It's sort of like a baseline testing for our new seminarians. Some of you are just beginning your discernment of a vocation to the priesthood. Others are actually well advanced and along the way, having been in the seminary already or some sort of seminary formation. But I want to kind of give an overview of what discernment is because this is a house of discernment as well as a house of decision. The new Ratio Fundamentalis speaks of seminary formation. One of the important elements of seminary formation is that men are formed to be men of discernment. And that every priest has to be a man of discernment, especially in his pastoral ministry, as he helps people discern the will of God in their life. So we have to be experts in this discernment. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I begin first and foremost with the vision and mission statement of our seminary, an established vision and mission statement, which our board has approved. Um, the vision statement, as you can see here, is why. It's the why question, why of, of the mountain. To invite men to go up to the mountain, which is Haggai chapter 1, verse 8, so that we might send down holy, self-sacrificial shepherds for the people of God to light a fire on the earth for the salvation of souls. Why are you here? That's why. And then what is it that we do at the Mount, the mission? Fundamentally, it is preparing men for the Catholic ministerial priesthood in the third millennium. Men who love with the heart of the church, think with the mind of the church, and are formed to have an integrated core of human, intellectual, spiritual, and pastoral virtues modeled by Jesus Christ, our high priest. That's what we do here. This is why we do it, and this is what we do. Right? That's for the whole seminar. Okay, so vocational discernment. We start with a basic concept, and in order to understand discernment, we have to begin with the end in mind, I say. You know, Steve Covey has got that famous book, we, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I think it is. Yeah, Highly Effective People. So one of those habits is that if you want to do anything, you want to figure something out, begin with the end in mind. It's a very Aristotelian principle as well. Where are you headed as seminarians? Anybody? Heaven. Heaven, yes. That's your call to holiness. What about your call to the priesthood? Where are you headed? Your diocese? No, ordination as a priest in your diocese. So the call to holiness in heaven is what we all have because of the, we're being baptized. But what you're, you're discerning in particular is your particular way. And your end in mind is ordination as a diocesan priest for, for most of you or the oratory um, in, that, in that particular local church. Right? That's the end in mind. And so when we start with the end in mind, when we're trying to discern a vocation to the priesthood, we start here which is the very end of your vocation. In a certain sense, you could say that your vocation, as far as being called, ends right here in this dialogue. Living that vocation as a priest begins here. Right? This dialogue takes place at the ordination rite, the mass. And as you can see, the deacon gets up, and says, let those to be ordained priests come forward. And that's when the deacons step forward. The priest, a priest, it's usually the vocation director, director of seminarians, says, most reverend father, he's addressing the bishop. Holy Mother Church asks you to ordain these men, our brothers, to the responsibility of the priesthood. The bishop says, do you know them to be worthy? After inquiry among the Christian people and upon the recommendation of those responsible, that's us, by the way. Um, I testify that they have been found worthy. 
then this is your, the end of your vocation as a call, and the beginning of your vocation as being lived. Right? The bishop then calls you. This is the official call, the vocation. Right? Relying on the help of our, Lord Jesus, uh, of our Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ, we choose these, our brothers, for the order of the priesthood. Thanks be to God. The vocation is voiced by the bishop. It's God's call to you through the church and the person of the bishop, and he's called those deacons. They now have a vocation. Right? Discernment of having that vocation is over at that moment. Living it comes after ordination. Right. Okay, now there are two dangers, I would say, in this process, right? The first danger is not coming to know Christ. So in the discernment process, we have to come to know the one who is calling us in his church. And the other danger is not to come to a decision. This is a house of discernment, but also a house of decision. There is a moment in which you need to decide so that you come to this moment and can say, you can step forward and receive the call from the bishop. You know, my, I, I can sense my own vocation when I was, the first inklings I had of a vocation, I was five years old. My mother tells me the story because I don't remember. Um, as the uh, prophet had said, I come from a rather big family, so we would always go to Sunday Mass at 8 o'clock in the morning. 8 o'clock Sunday morning, and after Mass, we come out and pack into the van and go home. Well, one morning when I was five years old, I was going, walking back with my mother to the van, and I said, I want to be a priest, just like Father Kurtz. He was a newly ordained priest in my parish, an assistant there. That was the first inkling my mother said that she ever had that I, I was and the voicing of that inkling um, to, to anyone. Father Kurtz is now Archbishop Kurtz, Archbishop of Louisville. But I knew at that moment there was something that God was calling. Even at five years old, that of course matures, as it has in your case. There have been a lot of ups and downs, right, after that, after five years old. But eventually, on June 1st, 1991, my bishop said that. And I know that I have a vocation to trying to live it ever since. All right. So, in the word seminary, can anybody see the two D's in there? You see the two D's? No, you don't see the two D's? Well, here they are. In the seminary, there is decision, and there is there's discernment, and there's decision. The two D's. And this is what's happening in this process. Right? Now, again, this is kind of baseline. Some of you certainly would have heard this, but we all need to kind of make sure that we review it and understand it. Every vocation to the priesthood has really three dimensions. The first we're very much aware of. We always say, well, God's calling me, right? And that is true. That's the first dimension of any. It's got to come from God. It is Christ on the Sea of Galilee, saying, come, follow me. Right? It has no other source. It doesn't have a source in ourselves. It has a divine source. It is Christ who calls his disciples. It's not the disciples who call Christ. Right? Unlike the times of Jesus, in which people attached themselves to a rabbi. They made the decision. However, Christ was the one who called his disciples. He's the one who gives you your vocation. It is the thou dimension of a vocation to the priesthood. Right? It is his initiative. It is his come and see to you. That's why we need to come to know Christ, in, especially in this time of your initial formation in the priesthood. Come to know Christ because he's the one who's calling, the thou. But then there is an ecclesial nature of the vocation. Because it is a dialogue with God and the church that has to take place. This is what the program of priestly formation says. Potential candidates for the priesthood must be in prayerful dialogue with God and with the church in the discernment of their vocation. The linkage of this divine and ecclesial dialogue is especially important 
because in the present context there is a certain tendency to view the bond between human beings and God in an individualistic and self-centered way, as if God's call reached the individual by a direct route without in any way passing through the community. So it passes through the church. The church is an essential element to your vocation. The formation team and all those involved with your formation in your diocese and here at the seminary are part of that ecclesial nature of a vocation. So the church needs to discern your vocation as well as you need to discern your vocation. You understand? So there's an ecclesial element to everyone. And the bishop himself ultimately is the one who does the calling. God calls through his body, the church. Right? And that's why it's very important for your pastoral field education, whether it's during the summer or during your time here, we get responses from your supervisors and from people who you've been interacting with. That's all part of that, that after inquiring among the Christian people. That's, we're asking the Christian people, the people of God, to comment on whether or not they think you, you should be a priest. To give us this element, the ecclesial nature of a vocation. But then, of course, there is a personal nature to your vocation. There's you. And you need to do that work of discernment with God's grace. I, the I, must discern. You can have all the desire in the world, but you must be fully engaged at the level of your intellect, your will. This is a vocation that I believe I have. And what is it that you want? Ask your, voc your, your spiritual director, especially, and your formation advisor. Help me to see what is it that I really want. Some young men have come to me and said, well, I want to be a father. I said, you'd be perfect as a priest. Because that desire is an important part of being a priest, the wanting to be a father. The ministry of the priest is therefore also the ministry of fatherhood, the director of the clergy said. So our desires are very important. It's important that we discern ourselves and our own personal prayer with the help of others. But you have to decide. You are an essential element to a vocation of the priesthood, to your own discernment. And that means being a protagonist in your own formation. Being a true protagonist. Being part of it, not just sitting back like you do on, you know, in front of a television and kind of receive everything but actually being active in your own formation because you are an essential element in discerning a vocation of the priesthood. Okay. Now, we all know that there are counter voices, the world, the flesh, and the devil, that will tempt you from discerning and then ultimately from following your vocation. Right? So these are the things we've just got to be aware of. There's always going to be these counter voices that will get into our our ears, our minds, and in our hearts, to kind of muffle the voice of God. So it is a battle, too, at times. We shouldn't be afraid of that. Right? Like yesterday's gospel. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. In discerning a vocation of the priesthood, and in your time here at the Mount, you're going to battle at times. For some of you, it might be really, really difficult and hard. Obstacles we put in your way. You might get confused, have sort of troubles and sorrows. So there is a battle that's taking place. But know that it is I. Do not, do not be afraid. So what is the process of discernment? This process that I'm about to share with you is just three steps. And it comes from the 2018 Synod of the Bishops, entitled Young People, the Faith and Vocational Discernment. And it outlines three particular steps on how, if you will, to discern. First, it says, is to recognize. Recognize. God is constantly speaking to us. I used to tell people in the parish, I can't get God to shut up. Right? He is constantly speaking to us in so many ways. We have to recognize his voice and see his voice in presence and events, people even in our own affections and desires in the light of faith. We sense attractions to pursue a variety of choices, but sometimes without the clarity of a decision 
Recognizing means taking stock of these multifaceted aspects of our lives without at first making a judgment and considering them in the light of faith. So take a look at your life within the light of faith. That's recognizing. That's why we need to spend time in prayer, because we take our lives to God and help see the divine aspect, the supernatural outlook of our life. By doing that first, we can better discern God's will in our life. But then the next step, the Synod document says, is interpreting. That means taking all of those signs in our life and understanding what the Spirit, it says, in calling the person to do through what the Spirit stirs up in each one. In this stage of discernment, one has to confront the reality of life and consider the possibilities that are realistically available. It is carried out in a dialogue with God in prayer and can be assisted by other people. So what is it that you're bringing to your formation advisor and your spiritual director? It's this interpret. How can I tell? Right? What, is, what is this saying to me? Help me to see, to understand. What I've recognized as God in my life, what does that now mean? And then the final step is, of course, choosing. For discernment really um, cannot be fulfilled unless there is a choice in freedom to be made. Choosing is the result of recognizing and interpreting the many thoughts, desires, feelings, opinions, events, and circumstances that are in your life and will be in your life over the next number of years and are part of your decision in the light of faith and are assisted by others to finally say yes to what you have discerned to be God's will. And then I just want to add one small thing, and I think is a sure sign that we have done this correctly, we've done this process correctly, because in choosing, we experience joy, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. This joy, peace, this real understanding that, yes, this is exactly what God wants of me. We find in the greatest of saints this deep supernatural joy because they're doing what the Lord wants them to do. Their whole life has been aligned to his and to his will. This is a, a quote from a, a small little book in the priesthood called Ministers of Your Joy. And it says, The crucified one, precisely because he or she has accepted the crucified one, knows the grace of the resurrection. Such a person must be full of joy. And there's a good sign that you've made the right decision. Okay. So, what should I do? What should I do? Those of you that have been, have just begun this process of, of discernment, you're here in the seminary for the first time, um, might be asking this question. Those of you that have been in seminary before have been in this process. So let me just summarize some good practical steps. Pray. That's just, not just a pious um, suggestion. It's an essential element. And here at the Mount, as I said to you last night, we put a great emphasis on the holy hour and living your holy hour, not just doing it, but bringing your life to your prayer and your prayer to your life, living your holy hour. The dialogue with God is intimately carried out at that moment. It can be done in other ways, but that's when we really take the time, put everything aside, and spend time, an hour, with our Lord right? in true prayer and dialogue. Our Pope Emeritus Benedict says, a short time ago you asked me, how can one recognize God's call? Well, the secret of a vocation lies in the capacity and in the joy of distinguishing his voice to recognize the Lord, to hear him like a person who is near me and who loves me. Said in one word, the secret of a vocation lies in the relationship with God. There it is. Okay. Another thing is to trust and be sincere. 
And this is not just simply the trust in God and sincerity with God. Yes, that's true. But as the PPF points out in its um, section on human formation, it also means that there's an assumption that the candidates for the priesthood, seminarians, have, quote, an ability to trust the church and the agents of formation. Now, you don't all know us very well, right? You might even not even quite know our names. Right? I'm not seeing your face. Um, it's not our faces, yes, yes. So, um, this trust will take some time, we recognize. But it's essential for you, in your discernment, to, if you will, give that trust and to be sincere with your formation advisor, your spiritual director, those agents of formation, if you really want to know the Lord's will for you. So we're going to certainly act to earn that trust. And what I ask of you is to give that trust and that sincerity. We want what's best for you. And I will tell you this right now, so pay attention. I want, as rector, all of you to be priests. I know that all of you will not become priests, just because of averages, right? There will be some that will discern God's will elsewhere. But I want all of you to be priests, because I love being a priest. It's a great gift. And if you're discerning, maybe this is a gift that God's giving me. I really would like that for you, all of you. We're on your side, in other words. And we want what's best for you. We would like you and want you to be a priest. But above all, we want you to do it because God wants it, not because I want it. Okay. Be at peace, too. That peace and joy that comes again, as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It was, uh, there's a famous uh, spiritual writer, who's still alive, Jacques Philippe. Anyone ever heard of him, Father Jacques Philippe? Well, he says this. I would add that the only time we have had we have good, good discernment is when we are at peace. When we're preoccupied by worry, disturbed by events in our lives, our emotions get the best of us, and we don't have an objective grasp on reality. We are tempted to see everything in black and white and question everything in our life. On the other hand, when we are at peace, we see life clearly. But the problem has robbed us of our peace. The most important thing is not to resolve the problem in the hope of regaining our peace, but to regain a minimum of peacefulness, and then to see what we can do to face the problem. So be at peace. I think all of you know, even the new seminaries know the importance of spiritual direction and formation advising. These are the formators that are most important to your life, your spiritual director and your formation advisor. They are key. And that sincerity and trust needs to be above all with, with them. And then finally, never be afraid to ask questions. Even Our Lady said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know man? Fish are caught by the head. And so it means that you need to think and sometimes ask questions of, of people, like particularly your formation advisor and spiritual director, to help you better discern and clarify what God wants of you. And so, this is the picture from last year. I hope to replace this picture very soon. All right? Because uh, you should be there. All right? This is, again, last year's picture. So, I'm looking forward to replacing that picture and to know, here's our new men. Uh, those that are beginning their journey here at the Mount, as they move from discernment to decision. So thank you, gentlemen, very much. And I'll hand over the presentations to Monsignor. God bless you.